tonight on Crime Stories. Do we rehabilitate people? People want to have to change themselves. I mean, what's punishment and what's torture? Johnny, yeah, I didn't want bitch. You have to meet force with force, and, and uh, we will always come out the victor. And all you're hearing all day is slamming doors and metal hitting metal. That's not what I want to do. This is a This is Crime Stories. I'm Richard Belzer. Tonight, a journey inside one of America's most infamous maximum security prisons. You'll go behind the scenes with members of the prison's elite security unit as they fight crime behind bars. It's a rare look at the lives of these unseen and often forgotten law enforcement officers who carry out their duties far from the public eye. Massachusetts, Walpole State Prison is the end of the line. It houses 700 of the state's most violent, unmanageable offenders. 300 corrections officers come to work here every day. Their job is to impose order onto an environment that constantly threatens to spin out of control. Morning. How you doing? No, you're not carrying any bullets or... This security checkpoint is the only way in or out. Since it was opened in 1956, no one has ever escaped from Walpole. Okay, two cameras. Whatever you guys are carrying. Do you know that aluminum foil is contraband? Thank you. And I'm going to stamp your inner right wrist just in case you guys get lost in there. I don't think you want to spend the night, right? What do they make out of aluminum foil? I mean, just about anything. You can make little bombs out of it. They use matches. Anything with a spark on that's. It's not allowed in an institution. How do you make a bomb out of aluminum foil? Mm -hmm. If you have 24 hours in your cell, you can think of a lot of ways. You have some smart inmates in here. Say again? We can come to work one morning and not go home. Um, and certainly that, that plays heavily on your mind sometimes. We've had people quit the first day that they come in. Some people, it takes them a little bit longer, but you know within a short period of time whether this is for you or not. We came here to follow an 11-member team known officially as the Inter-Perimeter Security Unit, or IPS. They are the police in a world composed entirely of the state's most hardened criminals. Same thing. Okay, just step out there. What gets you into Walpole is repetitive misbehavior at other institutions. We have inmates serving sentences in here ranging from um, drug convictions to multiple homicides, um, and it runs the entire gamut. Um, it's not just based on your crime. The majority of it is based on your behavior. Within hours, one gang member has slashed another. The IP security unit has recovered the weapon, a handmade steel shank. It looks a little long for the clamp. Uh, the spoon, spoon is rounded. He may have cut that. Yeah, it is cut on the end. Last year alone, 98 inmates were seriously assaulted at Walpole and 260 weapons were found. Where are they getting that from, Jimmy? Javino Rivera's cell. If this is the way society wants to run their prisons in an orderly fashion, we have to investigate crimes within the prison. We're not going to call the local police to come in here and do that. It's our jurisdiction. It's our responsibility to do that. Your metal comes down, and it, and it folds right back up again on the other side. I'm pulling that off, snapping it off. The front still looks the same, but the back edge is gone. Yeah, we'll have to check those. My brain is mangled. This is a, this is a 
Through the process of interrogation, the security unit hopes to gain information about other homemade weapons hidden within the cell block. Hey, if he kicks something in later on, we can do something for him. Yep. Maybe. Yep. No guarantees, though, naturally, but... Yeah, he says he's all done because okay. information purposes, his information line's done. Okay. Because if he goes back now, he's a f***ing hero, you know what I'm saying? Now I think the next thing may be shaking the whole block. That's, I'm waiting for that one next. <laughs> you know it's coming. Yeah. You know it's coming. That's all right. We gotta, we gotta be able to, uh, I don't know, we gotta be able to go in there and take our time. Really take our time. Right. And just go through every little, every little thing that's in there. That's right. The interrogation proved successful, and Lieutenant Grassi orders a surprise shakedown of the cell block known as Plymouth 2. Kenny, what's your 20 right now? Just give him your name. 45, 44, 43. Let's go. All, right. All set. Ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go, go. All right. That's the block. Get these guys in. I hear all these toilets flushing. Does that mean anything? Yeah, they're probably flushing things they're not supposed to have in their cells. Uh, whether it's paperwork, maybe even weapons. So. Shakedowns are a logistical nightmare. The goal is to empty all 45 cells while keeping gang members from attacking one another. We've got to be real careful in this block because there's five sectors, and you got to really be careful who you let out with who. There's five sectors of uh, nine inmates each. Those nine are compatible with each other, and if we kind of intermingle sectors, we're asking for troubles. Be cognizant of who's out with who. We're going to try to stay within the sectors. Okay. Andy, what we're looking for also are those uh, hard toothbrushes, the oral bees. The oral bees. Do you know what they look like? Yeah. Take those. Take those. Yeah, okay. take them. This line of business is kind of uh, paramilitary. I like to look at it as paramilitary as opposed to uh, being like a police department. My father was in the service. So uh, I'm an army brat, so I think that brought me a long way because he was kind of a squared away person. He liked to have his uniform squared away and his boots shined. So you, you learn, learn from that. I've been having a problem with these eyeglasses because they're inside these uh, earpieces, if that's what they are. There's a sharp metal thing that's already sharpened to a point, and these guys have been stripping off the plastic and using these as weapons. Let's go see what this guy's up to. Yeah, stand over in the slop sink. Why? Because you can't be with these dudes. Right in the slop sink. All right. What's up with these? These inmates try to be intimidating. Where's the other part? So uh, the other you kind of call their bluff. You have to know when they're not bluffing, of course. But you have to meet force with force, and, and uh, we will always come out the victor. You got a prescription for these? I use them just for fun. Around. Yeah? yeah. Fucking around, huh? Yeah, OK. We'll be checking that out. I take, I don't give. The guys on the second tier, if you notice, I've been constantly looking up at them. If they start going astray or if they're doing something silly, I'm going to be right on it. Keo Van or Van Keo. See if he's supposed to have some glasses because uh, we're missing those. Oh, we're definitely those. removing those. Where's the two ends? He don't know. He threw them in the trash. He's not going to be able to get a new pair. That's correct. He says he needs them for right. round, not even reading. Little retrieving line here, hey, fellas. Did it? It's a retrieving line. Uh, what does that mean? When they're okay, locked in, so they can we, send. We uh, can uh, can they can put a weight on the end of it and send things around to anybody in the we block. You know, they throw it over the tier, and the next guy will pass it down. It's, it's, it's a way of getting things around into the block in the block. So I'm going to tell the inmate. That I want to check this toothbrush out because it looks like it may be one of the ones we're looking for. He's got this wrapped around pretty good here. Excuse me, Norm. There was another question I had too, Van. Keo, K-E-O. Can we check and see if he's got a current prescription on eyeglasses? Hmm. Oh, stinger. This is a heating device. What they do is they uh, plug this into the wall socket, and it's two pieces of metal. Usually, a, as you can see, it's an old nail clipper. As long as you keep them separated by a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic, you can plug this into the wall and this will start heating up cherry red hot. You put it, they put it in a cup of water and it boils the water. See, the, the tough part about that is that the, if it gets wicked hot, like you would have it you know, on, on top of your stove, you can throw it at the staff. Got your stinger. Last year, 24 officers, or nearly 10% of the workforce, were violently assaulted by inmates often during routine operations like this. 
Somebody's got to watch your back. I mean, you can't be doing it. You got your eye in that camera right there. Some of these guys, I'm telling you, you know, you, you turn your back and you get lax and you walk into tears. Someone can reach out and do something silly to you. Even if it's not life-threatening, you still don't want to be disrespected like that. So. We got to watch that camera guy, man. He's going to get jumped. Huh? He's going to get stabbed. Watch Who's that? The camera guy. Close one nine. Dear Mr. O'Reilly, parentheses, Mr. Dead Man, I hope that when you get this letter that you're fucking dead. Hi, what's up? Nine Block, Lucio, Cox, KL, Diver, Plymouth One, Hernandez. May the loss of Hepta. This morning, the security unit is trying to head off a racial conflict. Left unchecked, this is the sort of activity that can set off riots. Sergeant Steve Kennedy and Alex Rodriguez are assigned to a surveillance operation to monitor the inmates. From an observation gallery, Alex serves as the eyes watching the inmates through one-way mirrored glass. We picked up some information yesterday that a possible racial um, problem was happening yesterday. It was a large number of blacks and a large number of whites. Had a discussion. Um, from there, they dispersed. And what we're doing today is just keeping an eye on what we call like the heavies. Um, guys who pretty much have a, lo a lot of word or say in the block. He's trying to um, get a racial thing going between the whites and the blacks. He, he, um, is he white or black? Yeah, he's a white guy. He's one of the, he's an older white guy, maybe in his mid-40s, trying to get these younger kids up and coming to join him. Walpole is an outdated, maze-like facility, but the IPS security unit has managed to turn the ventilation shafts and inner corridors into hidden listening posts. They're aware that we do come down here and monitor them, but if, if they hear our radio going or if they hear us creak on a, on a, on one of the grates, what they'll do is they'll yell Ips behind the block, so that way it warns the other inmates in the unit that we're back there. But as long as we're quiet, they should have no indications that we're back there. Be careful there with your flashlight because that window right there is not a one-way mirror. They can see you. We're gonna go up to the second floor now. cell 34 um, but they're in front of the cell so I don't know what you can pick up they can see you out of back there you wouldn't believe what you heard <laughs> you have one guy come over to another guy hey hey John I'm looking to get a weapon you know what do you got well I know a guy who's got a a 12-inch piece of steel. I know another guy who's got a pick. Oh, okay, all right, great. What do you want for it? Talking about what the who's making the homebrew tonight and uh, what time they're gonna what, what time they're gonna get together and split it up. Whoa, you all right? Walpole will always be Walpole. And they're stuck with us, and we're stuck with them until further notice. Anyway. 
Alex Rodriguez has particular first-hand knowledge about gangs from having been raised in the inner city. There are so many gang members here, they're kept isolated in four designated cell blocks to prevent them from gaining new recruits. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna strain that up. Prison gangs are highly organized, making them the biggest threat to security. The mere presence of our cameras seems to have set them off. Nobody's face is going to be on. I know, that's not the point, though, you know what I'm saying? That's it's not up to me. I just follow orders, man. We're going to get them out of there. What's going on? Huh? What's going on? Yeah, they're not happy. So it'd probably be better off to uh, do it from outside. OK. Hey, they didn't want you in that block. No, they didn't want us in there. Uh, basically, <laughs> basically, uh, they're just giving us a heads up, you know. Hopefully we have that respect, we can relate with each other. It should be no biggie, though. And who would they, uh, who would they most be angry at? Me. Why? Because I'm the gang officer and I should have known better. And that's how they play it. Dealing with gangs involves unique risks. Their power can extend far beyond the prison walls. About a year and a half ago, uh, I had an incident where a number of guys showed up in front of my house, uh, threatened me, um, basically told me to stop doing what I'm doing. But um, no, you know, nothing assaultive, no physical action occurred. They walked away, I walked away. Um, so it was, you know, it was a big thing. Sometimes you gotta be very careful on how you, you relate with these guys. If they need, want to find out where you live, they have no problem doing it. Threats from inmates come in many forms. This afternoon, the security unit has intercepted an intimidating letter to a state prosecutor. We wrote a letter to the district attorney's office, the state police call. It's a real nice letter. Uh, Dear Mr. O'Reilly, parentheses, Mr. Dead Man, I hope that when you get this letter that you're dead, I'm going to have my people put a bomb in your car. I'll also have a bomb in your house and yours. Um, how's your wife doing? I'm sure you don't want anything to happen to her. And it also says, P.S., get back to me, motherfucker, because mm. um, you'll die real soon, so count your blessings. Kenny, I'd like you to take a look at this here. Sure. Death threats and what have you. Sure. We need somebody to go down and take him out and uh, have a word with him. OK. On the streets, you have a, a situation with the uh, Middlesex uh, <laughs> attorney's office? Yeah, yeah, I got problems with them. Did you Big write them any letters? I wrote them letters. Recently? Uh, about two weeks ago or something like that. You're going to have to start seeking some better avenues than this. You send out things to these people in these high places. <laughs> it's going to come back and haunt you, buddy. And you just came out of a situation over the weekend where you got involved <laughs> with the officer down there doing, doing the same damn thing. Yeah, no, he threatened an officer yesterday, too. He uh, threw juice in the officer's face and did threaten his him with bodily harm and yeah. death. You're not going to go too far like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, whatever you're doing time for, you, what are you doing time for? For myself, for, um, uh, supposedly killing my uncle. <clears throat> and, you know, I got a deep problem. You know, I got, like, a personality problem. One minute I'd be a thugster. Next minute I'd be a cry little, you know, a sh shy little baby type person. Okay. I can't think of anything else. Can you, uh, Officer Rivera? Dave, we're all set. Thank you. I've been here 16 years, and everybody in here is uh, a bad guy. Yeah, An inmate, yeah, get under your skin. If they know more about you than what, what meets the eye here at your workplace, they're going to utilize that to their advantage, sure. No question about that. We hear stories that um, inmates, you know, spit in the food. The stories, they uh, squirted semen in the food. Anything, you know, something falls on the floor, they put it back in. You know, the worst possible thing you can think someone can do to food, they've probably done it. So that's why a lot of, you see a lot of the old times will never, never touch it. They'll bring their own food. But, um, I eat it. <laughs> you know? A bus falls seven days a week, every single chance they get. This is a horror. Day five at Walpole. There's been another stabbing in one of the cell blocks, and the security unit converges on the infirmary. This time, the weapon is a homemade pick aimed at the heart. The victim survived only because the weapon struck a rib. 
The other guy down here yet, uh, yeah, Scott? Yeah, no yeah. The perpetrator of the stabbing, Nathaniel Harbin, is taken in for questioning. He is already serving a life sentence for first-degree murder. I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut that door. Listen, I'm gonna take those cups off. Don't give us a hard time, all right? All right. Walpole historically is a violent facility with violent offenders. These are people that are the worst that society has to offer. I think society thinks that they're locked in their cells all day long, that we beat them every other day. Um, they just, they don't understand. Um, and I don't think they want to. When did you come up with that makeshift weapon? Today? Yesterday? Yeah, Is that right? Well, what was it made out of? A can or something? Yeah. Yeah, bomb saw can. Okay, you couldn't get no uh, flat stock, round stock? Well, I don't be looking for weapons. You know? what, no he's problem. just a little dude coming off like he's bigger than life itself. Is that what we're talking that about here? That alone made me think that this motherfucker must be really crazy. Because I'm like, damn. Mm -hmm. Don't he know I can break his damn neck? This one right here? Yeah. He took three. He took one in the chest, one in the arm, looked like a defense wound. Yeah. Because there was no blood evident in the cell anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. Go set Ken for him. So if it's still there, I'll go back. His TV was covered for them. Did you see that? Yes. So he, he must have known it was coming. You know what I mean? Okay. If it, if it got to get physical, it got to get deadly. That's the only rule. If it if you don't want to die, don't fuck around. That's it. I'm the first person who's willing to squash any beef. Any kind of problem to stop, leave that alone. Leave it alone. This is going to get dangerous. All too often, the officers have to deal with inmates like Nathaniel, lifers with nothing left to lose. So what was your intent? Did you stop him or kill him? Well, it was my initial, my initial intention was just to get him. But then as I got into it, I was like, might as well go all the way. No one understands us. How can you have a conversation with somebody about fecal matter on a wall or someone urinating at you? Or, they hang on your every word. Or uh, someone attempting to stab you or someone saying they're going to kill you. I, I, I don't think my wife's ever mentioned to me once in nine years that someone attempted to stab her. And that's just not a common thing. Come in. They told us the whole thing. He said, at first, I was just, was, when I was doing them, I didn't have any intent on nothing. But since I was right into it, I said, I'd go all the way, kill him. Deemed too dangerous, Harbin is taken to segregation. It's the first step on the way to solitary confinement in the DDU. This is Sergeant to your city, the Yips unit. Officer Rivera. Thank Rive you. Officer Rivera. The DDU is the infamous disciplinary unit at Walpole, a prison within a prison, with one of the highest levels of security in the United States. We have inmates in there that can be sentenced up to 10 years for disciplinary offenses within the institution. Um, it's a punishment designed housing unit. It's not for rehabilitative purposes. It's to punish. There's really no other lower place you can go than here. As far as if you have, if you're a disciplinary problem, this is it. This is DDU. There's nowhere else you can go. Hell is next from here. Assaultive, disruptive throughout the department, um, and they're segregated 23 hours a day. They're allowed out uh, one hour a day, five days a week. They are repetitive offenders. Uh, they're people that have been through the system two, three times, and, and they're here again. Compassion? I have no compassion for any of them. How many times you get a pancake like this, right? How many would it take for you to fill up on this? Well, I'm not really sure how much it would fill, fill me up. I'm being told that's, uh, that's efficient. You're all set. Huh? You're all set. Yeah, I'm all set. You stick it in your ass. OK, it's OK. They fuck all seven days a week, every single chance they get. This is a horror house. They feed us cold food, and when we complain about it, they claim we're looking to the issue. 
Nothing is done. What was it that you did that got you into prison in the first place? In prison, I mean, prison for killing uh, police. DDU inmates are allowed three showers a week, lasting 15 minutes each. A three shower door. Even this simple act requires an intense level of security involving the supervision of at least three officers. I think you could do this job every day for 20 years? No way. Every day come in here and do this. Oh, motherfucker. Every day. <laughs> They come out here for recreation um, one time uh, every day. Uh, they're allowed to come out here, and they're separated uh, from each other just to prevent any problems or fights or anything like that. So they're placed in these cages. These people try to hamper and oppress. They do it very sneakily, though. They, they're very clever. They're very smart. Um, uh, they're, they're professionals when it comes to that. I've been here since May 30th, 1994. I have no TV, no radio. I get no visits, no phone calls. I'm not allowed to get no newspapers. I'm not allowed to get no magazines. It's basically isolated. Oh, I know what you forgot to say. I slashed the officer's throat. Yeah, that was Lieutenant Rossi. Yes, sir. That was right. That's who he assaulted? Yes, sir. That was our lieutenant, yeah. It was bigger. It's healed over time, but it's still there. Every now and then I, I'll rub it and it reminds me of that day, you know. You never get that out of your head. May 29th, 1990. And of course my poor wife, uh, my poor wife would never get that out of her head. I was transferred for the press for originally assaulting an officer in 90. They want to give me the worst of the worst. And this is what I end up with. Secure one, four, four. Charlie Chase is considered the most violent and unmanageable inmate at Walpole. Originally convicted of armed robbery and murder, he has racked up a record 132 disciplinary offenses behind bars, earning him the longest sentence ever in the DDU. Yeah, that's right. Get him down. Get him. Yeah. Um, as far as Charlie's concerned, he's stripped all the time. His cell is shaken down because he's a major um, escape risk as well as a threat to the security of the institution. He's caught all the time with makeshift contraband. He's caught with weapons. Okay. He's got a swastika painted right here, Steve. He's got, he's got one on his trap door, too. He's very disruptive down here. I don't think there's been one consistent month that he's behaved himself, so his time down here isn't counting, and that goes on a month-to-month -month basis. Do you think he's crazy? Crazy? Tries to come off like that, but theoretically, I don't think he's crazy, no. Given his often bizarre behavior, Charlie's lawyers question whether solitary confinement is in fact driving him insane. Along with 10 other DDU inmates, Charlie is named in a class action lawsuit claiming that the DDU employs cruel and unusual punishment. All this that you're witnessing is a conspiracy to keep a good man down. That's all it is. He's a clown. 
Now is not the right opinion. But he is. How long you been in here, Charlie? How long I've been here? Yeah. Uh, six years this this year. When are you getting out? I don't know. I got another nine years left. Yeah, they took a lot of good time from me, you know? Like I said earlier, it's it's like a conspiracy to set me up to leave me here, you know what I mean? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. We've had our problems down here. A lot of it's uh, been with forced moves in the cells, uh, uh, inmates refusing to come out of their cells, refusing to exit their cells. So a team would be put together wearing protective gear and we try to get him out. Some DDU inmates are considered so dangerous that it can require as many as six officers in full body armor to extract them from their cells. This particular move involves inmate Charlie Chase. For legal reasons, such incidents are always videotaped by prison officials. You accept that if you violate rules and regulations that you're going to be punished. But then there's a fine line between what's punishment and what's torture. You know, a guy that's behaving in, a, in a, uh, an odd manner because of being psychologically unbalanced is a lot different than what I knowingly did. I escaped. I mean, I knowingly knew what I was doing. But an inmate that's uh, having a psychotic episode and as a consequence of that behavior is put into DDU, something's very wrong with that. You know, that I have a problem dealing with. I go home tomorrow morning. What are you wrapping up? What's it been like for you? Hey, no, no. What do you think it's like? <laughs> it's it's been been if we put microwaves and uh, and refrigerators and washers and dryers in their cells, they'd find something else to complain about. Now, I mean, you can see their living conditions are not that bad. Some of the most dangerous inmates here show serious symptoms of mental illness. Hands right, your mouth. And for the security unit, dealing with these individuals can be intensely frustrating. Well, this inmate sent a letter to one of the mental health workers. He's been sending letters to everybody. So I'm just going to go through it and see what we've got here. A lot of it is just nonsense stuff, aggravation type things. And there's a nice little package of something here. I have no clue what it is. I'm starting to get an aroma of it now, and it smells like human regurgitation. You know how many letters I've gone through of yours over the last couple of months with, with feces in them and everything else in them? I mean, I don't really want to open it up because the letter stinks, and I'll probably stink up this whole room when I unseal this bag. So what, uh, did, uh, did you was a handwriting analysis expert, you know, hired to detect that that was my handwriting? It's, I mean, not, it's not needed. So you saying that there's no possible way that another inmate could have forwarded that, you know? No, I'm just asking you if you wrote it. I'm not, I'm not here to, to critique the, uh, the contents of the letter. I don't think there's a need to send it to a lab or to have it analyzed. I'm asking you, did you write the letter? Makes you feel like you want to do something to the guy to make it permanently stop, you know, deal with it uh, directly in different ways, but it, it makes you feel pretty disgusted. Do we have to screen every single piece of mail that you generate? Does it, ha does it have to come to that? I, I hope it doesn't. It's just, it'd just be tedious for me, you know what I mean? I don't feel like checking your mail every single day. I have no comment. Well, that's about the end of this. This individual also uh, threw a nice big cup full of human feces on the clergyman as the clergyman was standing by his cell trying to help him out. The inmate proceeded to stab him in his arm and then throw a big fluffernutter container full of human excrement 
all over the clergyman. Okay. We'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. In fact, for that last escapade with the uh, religious person, uh, I think that's going to get him some DDU time. Well, what happens at this point is the attack members up in the gallery are introducing gas into the unit. In the main section of Walpole Prison, a major disturbance has broken out in one of the cell blocks. We're denied permission to film during the incident and are only now allowed briefly to see its aftermath. I'm going to go down with the lieutenant. We're going to just make a round in the unit, see how things are going, take a peek in the cells, pull on the doors, just to get a general feel for what's going on. When you're doing something like that, maybe a con will stop you and they'll, they'll let you know what's up, give you a little feedback as to what's going on in that unit. How'd you end up in this thing? <laughs> I seen you come home from breakfast, right? Yeah, how do you get caught up in that stuff? This occurred because the inmates that were put in here were previously in a, a regular population block. They, they had yard privileges, they had uh, chow hall privileges, and I guess it's their way of protesting and being returned to higher custody. We'll just go ahead and monitor. Um, we'll monitor for any more ringleaders. If the ringleaders have to come out, they'll be taken out and be brought to SEG. So we'll, uh, we'll wait for the word from the top. How well, often does this kind of thing happen? Not very often anymore. Yeah. Not very often anymore. Later, Lieutenant Robert McGinnis shows some of the younger officers a videotape of what Walpole used to be like. This was March 6, 1981. It was a very long day. It started at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning with what we were going to consider routine moves to segregation um, of, I think, five or six inmates. I was at cell 15 down the end. And, and I believe it was an inmate on the third tier that was refusing to come out. You ever seen this tape? No, I have never seen this tape. Yeah. They're going in his cell. He's fighting. He's actually stabbed. The captain, you can see the blood. Where were you while well, this is going on? I'm one of those four or so officers that went down there, yeah. I was at the other end of the tier. We'd gone down. And what happens at this point is the TAC members up in the gallery are introducing gas into the unit. At this point, we've introduced some officers with shotguns. He's got a gas gun? No, shotgun. And I just think it was the, the strong will of the department to, to run its facilities and not allow inmates to run its facilities. And I, I think that concept holds true today, that you know, we run the institutions, not the inmates. say people in law enforcement have the highest divorce rate and this and that and um, it always seems to be that they let the, let themselves get stressed out you know or they take everything in or they you know being around in inmates all the time they're not here because they're the nicest people in uh, in society you know <laughs> and uh, prison life in general is depressing you know how long are you in here for Prison for 27 years. What'd you do? Second degree murder. Not too long ago, there was an inmate murdered in here. Um, as in other places of the prison, when you think, uh, you know, it's not a dangerous place because you look around and you see, well, everyone's working. This particular incident happened first thing in the morning. Uh, they arrived to work. And uh, by the end of the day, I mean, one was dead, so. That's the kind of things that transpire. Right in this area here, it's one of those things. There have been staff members over the years that have turned into alcoholics as a result of this job. Um, we've had people commit suicide in this business. And I really think a lot of it is because they don't do something to relieve their stress outside of work. What happens if you hear that alarm is always in the back of your head? Winds are going to go off. Uh, what do I do if the alarm goes off? What's my job? If everybody does their little job, then we should be okay. It could be anywhere from a homicide to s just uh, one inmate yelling at the officer or punching another inmate that the officer felt it the need to freeze the place up. That stress level is always there, yes. That's probably why our life expectancy is an average of 55 years.
Today at Walpole State Prison, inmate Louis Vega is going home. In just 30 minutes, he will leave solitary confinement in the DDU, be given a $50 check, and go directly back into society. <laughs> How long has it been, Lewis? How long has it been? Five years, some months. How's it feel now? Feels good. You know, it's... It's how it should feel, you know? After leaving these walls. I think that when an inmate finishes his sentence and commits some sort of heinous crime within a short period of time, there's a hue and cry that, well, he never should have been released. Well, he had to have been released. He finished his sentence and, you know, do we rehabilitate people? People want to have to change themselves. Most of the people that we see in our system are just career criminals, and doing time is just part of that business. It's a temporary setback. I can't say I'm never coming back, because where I come from, you know, it ain't um, cookies and milk. So and I'm going back home, back to the same place. I'm not gonna deny where I'm from, and I ain't gonna run from it either. Oh, man. Oh, well, let me be over here. <laughs> <laughs> they're seeing you, and they're, they're looking at you the way you, you know, conduct yourself, and they may try to emulate that. They may try to resent that, uh, your authority Sorry. figure. Mm -hmm. No, no. Believe it or not, you know, it's like with anyone you meet or anything you do, you, you leave something behind no matter where you go or what you do. You leave something behind with somebody. I believe that, you know? Maybe you can leave a little something good that when they do get back out into society, you know, maybe, you, maybe you've done a little good. It's not too often that you feel like you can, you've done some good. Hey. <laughs> I'm not gonna stay here till I'm growing old, you know what I mean? You're surrounded by concrete and bars, and all you're hearing all day is slamming doors and metal hitting metal, you know? I mean, it, it gets to you, you know? I've seen some people retire and two months down the road drop dead of a heart attack. It's all thrown away, you know? And that's not what I wanna do. Your plans when you get out of here in 20 years? Oh, 20 years. I couldn't even tell you. Um, I'm hoping that I can have my kids in school. You know, that's pretty much how I'm thinking of them instead of me. As long as I'm living and happy, I'm all set, <laughs> pretty much. See, this, this is our seniority know. list. When you start make, when you make it to the front page, it's big of the seniority list. Right now. Well, Kenny's on the Kenny and Johnny are, are on second the second page. page, and I'm at the. That's well, cool. I might have snuck into the sec, second yeah, page. I went after that. These guys up at the top, boy, they're sitting pretty. <laughs> yeah. We wish we were them. They're dead in six months. You know, one foot in the grave. Right. I wish I was 30, 30, years. 30 years, 27, 25, 26, 25. You know, once they leave, you know, it's they're all done. Of course, don't ask what their mental capacity is. After That's right. Years. <laughs> they just want to stay so they can show off this front page. I'll still be here. The violence at Walpole poses.